Akasha and the Astral Light. One of the key ideas that we have adopted is that of subjective levels of being, inner planes, whereon consciousness, insofar as its vehicles have been developed, cognizes the nature of existence at those levels. As we can be aware of our environment and events in it at our physical level. As living be uh, beings evolve to function consciously on these planes and to be active on them, they constitute the hierarchies of beings that we dealt with in the previous cassette. These levels of being can be thought of in several ways. They can be thought of in terms of the predominating element characteristic or as a mode of consciousness, a field of subjective experience, corresponding to the principles of man as set out in the conventional esoteric classification of them that we used in cassette two. In the first cassette, we said that these realms can be thought of as forming a substructure to our physical plane and as having a direct relationship to it. They are the realms of powers, forces, energies, and even entities, constituting a potent hinterland to our ordinary world. At their lower levels, these are the realms of psychism, and they constitute an inner world, itself of several levels, next to ours, which is known in esotericism as the astral light. The Akasha, A-K-S-H-A, also spelt A-K-A-S-A, -A, we described as the first manifestation of the primeval homogeneous substance principle. It is that which itself, in its differentiated forms, gives rise to the elements which will be discussed in more detail on cassette 5. The information given us about Akasha and the astral light is fundamental to our understanding, not only of the metaphysics of existence, but the nature of the inner realms of cosmos, much of which reflects through to our physical plane. For the Western student, conditioned to think in terms of today's predominantly materialistic science, nearly everything we are told about Akasha and much about the astral light will seem highly speculative. It would be best, therefore, for the early student to accept, even though tentatively, what is said as definitions, as mere statements and let the ideas so inculcated germinate and grow. This they will do as the information begins to relate to what we know, as derived from our experience or schooling, or at least what we feel we know about ourselves and the world we live in. If the teachings are shown to relate to or explain these things, to that extent, they are validated and can be accepted as reasonable. As we learn about the astral light, we will feel to be on relatively firmer ground to start with than we are with Akasha. It is said that the astral light is a realm of Akasha, covering a number of levels. As far as our humanity is concerned, one of the levels of the astral light relates to the psychic atmosphere of our planet, and that, as we shall see, is of immediate concern to us. First, we must try to get some idea of what Akasha is in terms that may be meaningful to us. Esoteric science postulates that behind manifest existence at whatever level 
from the highest, most spiritual, to the lowest, most material, there is always the unmanifest, ever-enduring, unchanging, absolute principle that we postulated earlier. And we see that that is without attributes of any kind. It itself is therefore unknowable. It has, however, been described as the rootless root of all existence. It is something we can't think about because no symbol or word could ever represent it, nor can we ever know it as something objective to consciousness. Against this background, this postulated base, periodically, according to universal law, in due season, the processes of manifestation start again. The cosmos awakens from its long sleep and its worlds, its men and its creatures are reborn. First in the inner worlds and then slowly they emerge into objectivity and begin another period of active life. After the deep night of universal rest another day starts. The time scale of these days and nights is enormous, almost beyond imagining. But there are cycles within cycles, some of thousands of millions of years duration, some of millions of years, others of hundreds and even single years with their seasons. However, the universe in which we live is, to us, a present time physical reality. And, as such, it must have had a beginning, and as surely it will have an end. Regarding the rebirth of cosmos, we have the following passage. After Pralaya, whether the great or minor Pralaya, the latter leaving the worlds in statu quo, the first that reawakens to active life is the plastic Akasha, father-mother, the spirit and soul of ether. Space is called the mother before its cosmic activity and father-mother at the first stage of reawakening. That quotation is from the first volume of The Secret Doctrine, page 18. Uh, but here we have an important explanatory note. It is not the physical organisms that remain in statu quo, least of all their psychical principles. During the cosmic or even solar pralayas, but only their Akashic or astral photographs. But during the minor pralayas, once overtaken by the night, these planets remain intact, though dead, as, hu as a huge animal caught and embedded in the polar ice remains the same for ages. That's a footnote to the above quotation. The new ideas mentioned here concerning the different kinds of Pralaya will be dealt with later. And the significance of the use of the word photographs will become apparent as the nature of Akasha and the astral light is further explained. We can perceive from that quotation that Akasha has a power energy or force aspect and a substantial material form aspect in line with the universal duality. As the root sus substance aspect as opposed to the spirit or dynamic one, it is so to say pure spiritual substance. It is, as we see in the quotation above, referred to in esotericism as space, space itself, and space in this 
highest abstract sense is regarded as the universal matrix out of which everything in a manifested universe comes, at least in its substantial aspect. Occult science tells us that Akasha, with seven transformations or differentiations, is the highest material state of all the levels or planes of existence. But in its differentiated states, it has other names, particularly those of the elements which we, which we mentioned in connection with the constitution of cosmos in cassette 2. In the quotation we've just made from the secret doctrine, it is said that Akasha is the spirit and soul of ether, E-T-H-E-R. In the 19th century, the then science postulated a medium through which light could be transmitted even through a vacuum, such as space was then supposed to be. HPB was at pains to make it clear that what she called ether, E-T-H-E-R, was not the same as the ether of the then scientists. Hers is a, a differential of Akasha. And she also used the word ether to denote the nature of the astral light. We say more of these meanings later. But here's an informative passage. For the occultists, however, both ether, E-T-H-E-R, and the primordial substance are a reality. To put it plainly, ether is the astral light, and the primordial substance is akasha, the upadi, or base of divine thought. In modern language, the latter would be better named cosmic ideation, or spirit, the former cosmic substance, or matter. These, the alpha and omega of being, are but two facets of the one absolute existence. That's from the first volume of the Secret Doctrine, page 326. Referring back to the planes of being, we noticed lower states of substanti substantiality as we pass down the scale of being. Also, we find Akasha being referred to as ether, A-E-T-H-E-R, of which ether, the E-T-H-E-R, is said to be its third state or second differentiation. That's counting from the top. As we see above, the astral light is referred to as ether, E-T-H-E-R, but the astral light is also regarded as spanning the, lo the lower manifest inner planes, from the lower mental to and including the astral plane. So in a broad sense, Ether can be seen as the substance aspect of the inner planes from the astral, that's the one next above the physical, right up to the mid-mental. But more particularly, it relates to the substance aspect of the astral plane. Another passage <coughs> which uses the analogy of motherhood helps us to envisage better the meaning of some of these metaphysical terms. Upper ether, A-E-T-H-E-R, or Akasha, is the celestial virgin and mother of every existing form and being, from whose bosom, as soon as incubated by the divine spirit, are called into existence matter and life, force and action. 
that's from the first volume of the Secret Doctrine, page 332. At its highest level, Akasha is homogeneous, that is, the same all through and all of a piece. But it becomes atomic when enlivened by Fohat, the primordial cosmic electricity. It is said that he, that's Fohat, hardens and scatters the seven brothers, which means that he electrifies into life and separates primordial stuff or pre-genetic matter into atoms, themselves the source of all life and consciousness. That's from the first volume of The Secret Doctrine, page 76. The seven brothers can refer to the seven elements, which reflect into the seven major planes of cosmos. All aspects of cosmos are interrelated and interact, and all the planes and states exist, and they are what they are, only by reason of the hierarchies comprising them, each with its own powers and characteristics. Another passage which corroborates and adds something to that above is, Next we see cosmic matter scattering and forming itself into elements, grouped into the mystic four within the fifth element, ether the lining of Akasha, the anima mundi, or mother of cosmos. That is the fifth element counting from the top. That's the, from the Secret Doctrine, first volume, page 97. The term anima mundi is used in a variety of ways in the Secret Doctrine, but generally it is used to convey the idea of the common, substantial, but pre-material living base to all existent things. It is the manifest base, or upadi, uh, that's spelled U-P-A-D-H-I, of all sentience, life, and intelligence, or consciousness, in a general sense. See the Theosophical Glossary for a fuller description. Akasha in the theosophical literature is closely associated with sound but in an abstract metaphysical sense as mother nature sound vash verbum logos she is a form of aditi the principle higher than ether a-e-t-h-e-r of akasha the synthesis of all forces in nature, the magic potency of occult sound in nature and ether, which voice calls forth the elusive form of the universe out of chaos and the seven elements. That's from the first volume of The Secret Doctrine, page 137. It is important that the I, the comprehensive nature of Akasha is grasped because so much hangs on it. In other systems it has other names, viz. Uh, Swabhavat, Mula Prakriti, etc. But perhaps none of them is an exact equivalent. Swabhavat commonly relates to the spirit matter combination and mula prakriti to the unmanifest aspect of akasha but enough has been said here to give a general impression of what akasha is and more is said on the next side we can now have a look at the astral light much more is said about it than akasha in the literature and generally what is said will have more meaning for us. It is the name given to the lower reaches of Akasha, but lower has to be taken in a very broad sense as the astral light embraces a number of planes. 
In the occult classification, the states of matter or elements to which correspond the principles of man's constitution, the cosmic planes, the planetary influences and so on, are those mentioned in cassette one. That is, <coughs> the uh, counting uh, upwards from the earth, the gr most gross, uh, earth, water, air, fire and ether, and two others about which we have very little information. But as tattvas, they have been referred to as adi, the first or undifferentiated state, and anupadika, A-N-U-P-A-D-A-K-A. -A -A. Element ether is the third counting from the top with Akasha proper as number one. It's the third differential. And fire is the fourth. And so on, down to earth as the seventh. As we have said, Akasha is the synthesis of the six, the six derived or differentiated elements. Now, uh, sometimes there is confusion between the terms A-E-T-H-E-R, ether, and E-T-H-E-R, ether, and the astral light. But we have explained the common use of these words. Sometimes, however, A-E-T-H-E-R and E-T-H-E-R are used synonymously but the sense in which they are used is usually quite apparent. It should be borne in mind that the astral plane, that's the second plane, counting the physical plane as the first, is uh, quite specifically a region of the astral light, but sometimes it's referred to as the astral light itself. Ether, as an occult element, not the chemical one, is, however, said to be only just starting to manifest at physical level. This is important to note. It will become apparent in the fifth root race and will manifest fully in the fifth round. The definition of the astral light given in the Theosophical Glossary is the invisible region that surrounds our globe as it does every other and corresponding as the second principle of cosmos the third being life of which it's the vehicle to the Linga Sharira or astral double in man. It is a subtle essence, visible only to a clairvoyant eye, and the lowest but one, viz. the earth, of the seven Akashic or cosmic principles. It radiates on humanity every evil influence, but the astral light gives out nothing but what it has received. It is the great terrestrial crucible, in which the vile emanations of the earth, moral and physical, upon which the astral light is fed, are all converted into their subtlest essence and radiated back, intensified, thus becoming epidemics, moral, psychic and physical. Finally, the astral light is the same as the sidereal light of Paracelsus, and other hermetic philosophers. Physically, it is the ether of modern science. Metaphysically, and in its spiritual or occult sense, ether is a great deal more than is often imagined. In occult physics and alchemy, it is well demonstrated to enclose within its shoreless waves not only Mr. Tyndall's promise 
and potency of every quality of life, but also the realization of the potency of every quality of spirit. It is the anima mundi, the workshop of nature and of all cosmos, spiritually as well as physically. The grand magisterium asserts itself in the phenomenon of mesmerism, in the levitation of human and inert objects, and may be called ether, ETHIA, from its spiritual aspect. The latter part of the above passage is quoted from Isis Unveiled, which was written in 1877 when ether was still postulated by a physical science. We must notice from this passage the dynamic or force aspect of the astral light. Much happens in it. To emphasize the point, the astral light is not only an inner region behind the scenes, as it were, of the physical realm, but it is an ocean, a medium of shoreless waves, wherein is realized the potency of every quality of life. It is visible to the clairvoyant, that is, someone with the sense of sight operative at the astral level. In the secret doctrine, however, it says that the astral light is not the container of all things, but only the reflector, at best, of this all. This is the first volume of the Secret Doctrine, page 255. Again, quoting Van Helmont, HBB gives us some further idea of its nature. Here, the question is of a very subtile spirit which penetrates through all, even the hardest bodies, and which is concealed in their substance. Through the strength and activity of this spirit, bodies attract each other and adhere together when brought into contact. Through it, electrical bodies operate at the remotest distance, as well as near at hand, attracting and repelling. All senses are excited by it, and through it, animals move their limbs. The astral light then interpenetrates the grosser matter of our physical plane. This makes possible and provides an explanation of clairvoyance in one of its aspects as being the ability to see through things like sealed envelopes. It is also a factor in some of the spirit feats in the seance room such as the passage of solid objects through a solid wall or the materialization of a physical object. All our senses operate by reason of the subtile spirit. This means that it is a necessary intermediary between the outside physical world and the inner man. It is by way of it that sense impressions register in consciousness. Further, it is, or it underlies, nerve currents by which our brain impulses, volitions and so on, affect our muscles, enabling us to originate and control our actions. Further, the astral light plays another role with many ramifications. Quoting HBB again, It is on the indestructible tablets of the astral light that is stamped the impression of every thought we think and every act we perform, and that future events, effects of long-forgotten causes, are already delineated as a vivid picture for the eye of the seer and prophet to follow. Memory, the despair of the materialist, the enigma of the psychologist, the sphinx of science, is to the student of old philosophies merely 
a name to express the power which man unconsciously exerts and shares with many of the inferior animals to look with the inner sight into the astral light and there behold the images of past sensations and incidents. Instead of searching the cerebral ganglia for micrographs of the living and the dead, of scenes that we have visited, of incidents in which we have borne a part, they, the Kabbalists, went to the vast repository where the records of every man's life as well as every pulsation of the, physical co of the visible cosmos are stored up for all eternity. That's a quotation from the first volume of Isis, page 178. Now here, we have an explanation of personal memory. All memory is stored in the astral light, but we have a particular affinity for that part of its content of which we have been the author. It is this to which we have ready access in the ordinary way. Another piece of information relevant to this is that our brains are a physical representation of an astral counterpart, which of course has ready access to the astral light in those areas in which it is developed to function. This astral brain is the link of consciousness between the inner and the outer man. man. Many other things are explicable by the nature and function of the astral light. We will examine some of these on the next side and on cassette 11, where we discuss more fully spiritualistic and psychic phenomena. This is the end of this side of this cassette. Please run it on to the end and turn over. An outline of esoteric science. Cassette 4, second side. Akasha and the astral light. Something of the nature of Akasha and the astral light and of their relationships to the planes of cosmos have been seen on the first side of this cassette. On this side, the importance of those relationships is emphasized and some additional information given. As a start, here is the definition of Akasha in the Theosophical Glossary. It is the subtle supersensuous essence which pervades all space, the primordial substance erroneously identified with ether, E-T-H-E-R. But it is to ether what spirit is to matter, or atma to karma rupa. It is, in fact, the universal space in which lies inherent the eternal ideation of the universe in its ever-changing aspects on the planes of matter and objectivity, and from which radiates the first logos, or expressed thoughts. This is why it is stated in the Puranas that Akasha has but one attribute, namely sound. The sound is but the translated symbol of logos, speech, in its mystic sense. The akasha is the indispensable agent of every kritya, k-r-i-t-y-a, magical performance, religious or profane. It is the power which lies latent at the bottom of every magical operation. This power is the akasha. In another aspect, Kundalini, occult electricity, the alkahest, universal solvent of the alchemist in one sense. The same anima mundi on the higher plane as the astral light is on the lower. Sometimes akasha is referred to as jivatma and divine astral light or the soul of the world and in other places it is equated to space 
in the uh, esoteric sense. The occult view of space is entirely different from what it is normally considered to be. Space is ordinarily thought of as a three-dimensional void, but the occultist regards it as non-dimensional. This is very uh, difficult to conceive, but an idea of what is meant can be got from considering a mental image or a dream scene. How big is such an image? And dimensionally, what does it relate to? One can apply no real scale of measure to it, nor any time scale. All is only as it seems. Similarly, where is a dream with respect to anything physical? But in the dream there are scenes and events, seemingly, all in space. But the space of such images and scenes is occult space. Similarly, an article, scene, or perhaps sense impression or even an emotional feeling can be called by the mind or imagination and will into and from such space. So that this inner space can be regarded both as the potential source of the evoked images and as the field for any subjective experience. On the cosmic scale, such space is occultly regarded as the ultimate potentiality of all that was, is, or ever shall be. It is the field of divine ideation. It is the dimensionless point which fills cosmos during manifestation as the ultimate seed from which everything comes. H.P.B. says, the universe in its ever-changing aspects on the planes of matter is expressed thought. Akasha is more than the passive material base of being at all levels. It is also this soul the spirit to act in and through as power and force. It is, as the definition says, an aspect of Kundalini, which is defined as the power of life, one of the forces of nature. The description of Akasha is further elaborated in a footnote in the proem to the secret doctrine as follows. Occult science has been teaching for ages that Akasha, of which ether is the grossest form, the fifth universal cosmic principle, to which corresponds and from which proceeds human manas, is, this is, uh, Akasha, is cosmically a radiant, cool, diathermous, plastic matter, creative in its physical nature, correlative in its grossest aspects and portions, immutable in its higher principles. In the former condition it is called the subroot, and in conjunction, conjunction with radiant heat it recalls dead worlds to life. In its higher aspect it is the soul of the world. In its lower the destroyer. That quotations from the first volume of the Secret Doctrine, page 13. We've mentioned before that the undifferentiated aspect of Akasha, its noumenon, so to speak, is Mula Prakriti, root matter. But sometimes this distinction is not made, and Akasha and Mula Prakriti are used synonymously. Quoting HPB, Mula Prakriti is the same as Akasha, seven degrees. Mahat is the positive aspect of Akasha and is the manas of the cosmic body. Mahat is to Akasha as manas, manas is to buddhi. The Umrik egg is Akasha and has seven degrees. 
being pure abstract substance, it reflects abstract ideas, but also reflects lower concrete things. That's a quotation from the third volume of the Secret Doctrine, page 546. The word Logos is much used in the Secret Doctrine. It is, in one sense, the collective entity of a unit part of cosmos, for example, the solar Logos. It is also used in connection with the three aspects of the One, representing the three primeval conditions of incipient cosmos at the start of a Manvantara, the period of activity. It is then, first, the unmanifest one. Second, the manifest one with its two aspects, father, mother. And third, the divine ideation, universal mind, which contains the idea, the pattern or plan of what shall be. These aspects are referred to as the three logoi. As it says at the end of the above quotation, the third logos and mahat are one and are the same as the universal mind, alaya which, as we have seen earlier, is regarded as akasha, where akasha is the vehicle for divine ideation. To avoid confusion, sometimes the second logos is regarded as unmanifest, as its only difference from the one is its polar or dual nature. Akasha, like all other aspects of cosmic being, whether constitutional or functional, is sevenfold. Its levels correspond to the universal hierarchical structure, the living beings or collective entities who reflect their characteristics into the substances or matter of the planes as the elements. However, let it be remembered that fire, water and air, or the elements of primary creation, so called, are not the compound elements they are on earth, but noumenal, homogeneous elements, the spirits thereof. Then follow the septenary groups or hosts. That's a short quotation from the first volume of the Secret Doctrine, page 218. Another quotation about Muruprakriti says that it is the noumenon of undifferentiated cosmic matter, the spiritual essence of matter, and is co-eternal and even one with space in its abstract sense. Root nature is also the source of the subtile invisible properties in visible matter. It is the soul, so to say, of the one infinite spirit. It is the primordial substance, which is the basis of the upadi, or vehicle, of every phenomenon, whether physical, mental, or psychic. It is the source from which akasha radiates. That's also from the first volume of the Secret Doctrine, page 35. This seems to be at variance with the statement above which said that Mula Prakriti is the same as Akasha. Both statements are repeated in the secret doctrine. Perhaps properly, Mula Prakriti is usually to be regarded as the unmanifest and Akasha the manifest aspect of primordial substance. Regarding the invisible properties in matter which derive from the inherent qualities in Akasha and which unfold as substance densifies into the planes of being until we reach our physical plane, we have them and their correspondences tabulated on pages 501 and 568 
of the third volume of the Secret Doctrine. Akasha here is specifically used in two senses. The first corresponding to the Adi, A-D-I, or highest tattva, and to the auric egg as primordial spiritual substance, akasha, substratum of the spirit of ether. The second sense is as alaya tattva, ether of space, akasha in its third differentiation, critical state of vapor. Above alaya, in this classification, is the Anupadaka Tattva, corresponding to Buddhi, spiritual essence, or spirit, primordial waters of the deep. An interesting passage which helps us to understand the relative roles of the auric egg, akasha, astral light, and ether is as follows. The auric egg is to the man as the astral light is to earth, as the ether is to the astral light, as the akasha is to ether. There are many other illuminating passages about the nature of the astral light and its relationship to akasha. One of them is the astral light stands in the same relation to Akasha and Anima Mundi as Satan stands to Deity. They are one and the same thing seen from two aspects, the spiritual and the psychic, the super ethereal or connecting link between matter and pure spirit and the physical. That quotations from the first volume of the Secret Doctrine page 197 footnote. Similarly, the astral light or anima mundi is dual and bisexual. The ideal, male part of it, is purely divine and spiritual. It is the wisdom. It is the spirit or purusha. While the female portion is tainted in one sense with matter and is indeed matter and therefore is evil already. It is, it is the life principle of every living creature and furnishes the astral soul, the fluidic perispirit, to men, animals, fowls of the air and everything living. Animals have only the latent germ of the highest immortal soul in them. This is quoted in the Secret Doctrine, Volume 1, pages 196 to 7, and is actually a quotation from Isis Unveiled, Volume 1, page 30. It was written before the more precise definitions and explanations of the Secret Doctrine had been made, but the highest spiritual astral light is obviously akasha. The life principle of every living creature is prana, operating in the astral double, the second principle. But both these latter are embraced in the astral light. Dealing further with the relation of the astral light to akasha, we have the following in the Theosophical Glossary on Anima Mundi. It is the soul of the world, the same as a liar of the Northern Buddhists, the divine essence which permeates, animates, and informs all from the smallest atom of matter to man and God. It is, in a sense, the seven-skinned mother of the stanzas in the secret doctrine. The essence of seven planes of sentience, consciousness and differentiation, moral and physical. In its highest aspects, it is nirvana. In its lowest, 
astral light. It was feminine with the Gnostics, the early Christians and the Nazarenes, bisexual with other sects who considered it only in its four lower planes. Of igneous ethereal nature in the objective world of form and then ether and divine and spiritual in its three higher planes. When it is said that every human soul was born by detaching itself from the anima mundi, it means esoterically that our higher egos, that's with a capital E, are of an essence identical with it, which is a radiation of the ever unknown universal absolute. This is a very comprehensive passage. The higher aspects of the anima mundi obviously relate to akasha in its three higher differentiations. They are divine and egoic in terms of man. The reference to nirvana is interesting as this, we are told, relates to the undifferentiated state sometimes called laya. L-A-Y-A. The lower aspects, those of manifest form, rupa, in the astral light regions, embrace the lower monastic and the karmic as one, the pranic, the astral, and then the physical. In effect, the astral light is the connecting link between the physical plane and the purely spiritual ones. It must be remembered, however, that all planes are derived from Akasha as its differentiations. The astral light is the lower levels of Akasha. There's a passage in the Transactions of the Blavatsky Lodge, page 74, which defines further the astral light in its relation to Akasha and Mahat and gives us other interesting information. Question. What is meant by prototypes existing in the astral light? This refers back to a passage in the Secret Doctrine, Vol. 1, page 63. Answer. Astral light is here used as a convenient phrase for a term very little understood, viz the realm of Akasha or primordial light manifested through the divine ideation. The latter must be accepted in this particular case as a generic term for the universal and divine mind reflected in the waters of space or chaos, which is the astral light proper, and the mirror reflecting and reversing a higher plane. In the absolute or divine thought, everything exists. And there has been no time when it did not so exist. But divine ideation is limited by the universal manvantaras. The realm of Akasha is the undifferentiated noumenal and abstract space which will be occupied by Chidakasan the field of primordial consciousness. It has several degrees, however, in occult philosophy, in fact, seven fields. The first is the field of latent consciousness, which is coeval with the duration of the first and second unmanifested logoi. It is the light which shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not of St. John's Gospel. When the hour strikes for the third Logos to appear, then from the latent potentiality there radiates a lower field of differentiated consciousness, which is Mahat, or the entire collectivity of those Jan Chohans of sentient life, of which Fohat is the representative on the objective plane and the Manasaputras on the subjective. 
the astral light is that which mirrors the three higher planes of consciousness and is above the lower or terrestrial plane. Therefore, it does not extend beyond the fourth plane where one may say the Akasha begins. There is one great difference between the astral light and the Akasha which must be remembered. The latter is eternal, the former is periodic. The astral light changes not only with the Mahaman Vantara but also with every sub-period and planetary cycle or round. Another question. Then, do the prototypes exist on a higher plane than that of the astral light? Answer. The prototypes or ideas of things exist first on the plane of divine, eternal consciousness and thence become reflected and reversed in the astral light which also reflects on its lower individual plane the life of our earth recording it in on its tablets therefore is the astral light called illusion it is from this that we in our turn get our prototypes consequently unless the clairvoyant or seer can get beyond this plane of illusion he can never see the truth but will be drowned in an ocean of self-deception and hallucinations. Question. And what is the Akasha proper? The Akasha is the eternal divine consciousness which, which cannot differentiate, have qualities or act. Action belongs to that which is reflected or mirrored from it. The unconditioned and infinite can have no relation with the finite and conditioned. The astral light is the mid or middle heaven of the Gnostics. We may compare the Akasha and the astral light with regard to these prototypes to the germ in the acorn. The latter, besides containing in itself the astral form, of the future oak conceals the germ from which grows a tree containing millions of forms. These forms are contained in the acorn potentially, yet the development of each particular acorn depends upon extraneous circumstances, physical force, etc. The categorical statement made above that Akasha cannot differentiate, have qualities or act, when on the first side of this cassette it was uh, said that Akasha is the synthesis of all forces in nature, the magic potency of occult sound in nature and ether, which calls forth the elusive form of the universe out of chaos and the seven elements, seems to be contradictory. These elements are, of course, qualities, and the planes of being are, in themselves, differentiations. The explanation is that, as eternal divine consciousness, Akasha cannot differentiate, have qualities, and so on. But as it says, Akasha is itself the magic potency of occult sound which calls forth the elusive form of the universe. In the stages of becoming a manifest universe it is other aspects of the one that have the function of energizing and differentiating. These are Fohat, Mahat and the creative hierarchies and the lords of the elements. Regarding the association of Akasha with occult sound we have though Akasha is certainly not the ether of science not even the ether of the occultist who defines the latter as one of the principles of Akasha only 
It is as certainly, together with its primary, the cause of sound. Only uh, a physical, um, that might probably be psychical, and spiritual, not a material cause by any means. That's a quotation from the first volume of The Secret Doctrine, page 296. Although it was said above that unless the clairvoyant or seer can get beyond this plane of illusion, he can never see truth, there is the following. For truly, the astral light has strange and weird secrets for him who can see in it, and the mysteries concealed within, it, within its incessantly disturbed waves are there. Then we have another piece of information about the astral light which seems to contradict the statement that it is not the container of all but the reflector. In cassette three, we introduced the idea of the hierarchies themselves collectively constituting the planes of being. A parallel is in the human kingdom, which is composed of individuals. It is a collective whole. The same is true for the astral light. It is said that it, or the lower ether, is full of conscious, semi-conscious, and unconscious entities. That's from first volume, Secret Doctrine, footnote 331. And on the same page it says that ether, E-T-H-E-R, itself an aspect of Akasha, has, in its turn, several aspects or principles. Also, it is one of the seven cosmic principles. In this latter context, ether is the lower realm of the astral light and is the second cosmic, the astral plane with seven subplanes. So, to summarize the information we have been given, Akasha is the root substance aspect of cosmos. It differentiates into planes and elements which correspond. It is that in which di divine ideation provides the germs of all that shall be. Sometimes it is likened to divine consciousness itself, but it is more properly its field of expression. Akasha is usually associated with the three upper spiritual planes. It equates to our ego. Ether is the name given to its third differential, and this corresponds to manas, man's fifth principle. And Akasha is eternal. The astral light comprises the regions below Akasha, those of form so-called. It reflects but reverses the spiritual realms above it and the physical below it. It is the home of memory. It is the domain of countless entities of varying degrees of consciousness. It is where the forces of nature play in and through to the physical realm. It surrounds our globe as it does every other and corresponds to the second cosmic plane or the astral principle in man. The matter of this plane is also described as ether and as a medium of transmission of energy. It is equivalent to the physical ether of the 19th century science. But it's a subtle, a subtile essence which conveys force between bodies even at distances and the life force in our bodies as nerve currents and so on. It is the link between the spiritual realms and the physical, both cosmically and in man, corresponding to his psychic principles. It is not eternal, it changes with manvantaras and rounds. It is that in which 
prototypes exist and through which they are projected into physical existence. It will be seen then that Akasha and the astral light are two important elements in our understanding of the nature and processes of cosmos. Without this information, we would lack key data for explaining the multitude of phenomena of existence, both ordinary and extraordinary. There is much else given us about Akasha and the astral light in the literature, which we would do well to study and memorize. We will find it indispensable in our understanding both of our universe and of our very selves. Eventually, every piece of data given us will fit into its place as a single jewel in the great crown of knowledge. This is the end of this cassette. <laughs>